Your life, Christian, and the good of the world, the right ordering of your family and the right ordering of society and even the eternal destiny of souls depends on the grammar and syntax. I don't know if you knew that, but it's true. Uh, those things depend on grammar and syntax because God, the only God who exists, is a God who speaks. Listen to Walt Kaiser's defense of this idea. He says, in the American colonies, people were taught to read and write, not primarily so that they could get a better job and improve their financial situation, but in the colonists' view, at least, so that they could better their spiritual health by reading God's word for themselves. Consequently, if putting the suggestions of this book, in which he's writing, into practice means relearning a few basic facts like the definitions of nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, and the like, then so be it. Let us relearn these definitions and the basic rules of grammar and syntax for the lives of men and women depend upon it. That was written in 1981 by a man who was burdened by the state of the church and the corresponding, correspondingly poor handling of God's word by its pastors and teachers. In, in Walt Kaiser's book, Toward an Exegetical Theology, this was uh, actually one of Dr. Zimmick's favorite books, Kaiser put forward a rare, somewhat groundbreaking introduction to the careful study of God's word, specifically for preaching. Practices like sentence diagramming and discovering authorial intent in each passage, those things have become commonplace in our church, uh, some other like-minded churches actually think it's a requirement to be able to sentence diagram be before you can become a member here. That's not the case, but it wouldn't hurt to learn. Uh, in, in this book, I mean, he is putting forward these things that for us, thankfully, have become commonplace and in his day, uh, not, not too long ago, this just burdened Kaiser so that pastors, instead of coming into the pulpit and waxing eloquent about their favorite theological subject, they would actually go to the text to discover what was that author's, that human author's intention because he knew the divine author, God, was moving on him to relay something specific. And Second Chronicles is an excellent place to observe and apply uh, the biblical principles that Kaiser is, is driving after. What Kaiser uh, goes on to articulate as antecedent theology or uh, what he calls antecedent theology or informing theology. Uh, Second Chronicles is actually a great place to see that play out. And I want you to just hear Kaiser's articulation of that principle, theology that has come before and the importance of it in discovering an author's intended meaning in a brand new passage of scripture that you might be reading or studying. This is a lengthy quote, but just, just listen and follow along as Kaiser articulates the importance of this to whatever you're studying in the Bible. He says this, quote, Many have noted that the strength of preachers who follow rather closely the pattern of preaching found in the Reformers is that the Reformers preach theologically. There is no doubt that when our teaching and preaching focus on the person and work of God, there are decided strengths and praiseworthy emphases. But even these strengths can be subverted when our methodology we do not when in our methodology we do not heed the biblical author's own theological motivations and presumptions. 
at least to the extent that he has explicitly referred to an antecedent theology, which he believes he is building onto in this passage. The exegete, the one studying, is responsible for what we have called the informing theology or the analogy of antecedent scripture. This emerging theology must take precedence over the legitimate concerns of a systematic theology. In no case should a later doctrine be used as an exegetical tool to unlock an earlier passage. That would be an extremely serious methodological mistake, for in effect, all revelation would then be leveled out. Virtually every passage dealing with a particular topic would end up saying almost the same thing as the latest revelation of God on that topic. Does that make sense? To read older passages of Scripture and assume that the authorial intent is to communicate exactly what some later doctrine has come to articulate is to read your Bible backwards. The older portions of Scripture, previous revelation, is not informed by what comes later. It's the exact opposite. And there are entire systems of theology uh, growing even in our day in popularity by practicing that way of reading the Bible, that the Old Testament is to be interpreted in light of the new. Uh, Postmillennialism uh, has come to be known by that hermeneutic. That's a hermeneutical pillar of postmillennialism, and that's reading your Bible backwards. Rather, the New Testament, or even newer revelation in the Old Testament, is informed by what has come previously. This is the proper way to read your Bible. So here, Kaiser's arguing that rather than imposing one's own theological concerns onto a text of Scripture, a good expositor must discover from each passage what was the burden of the author who wrote it. The burden of the divine author, God, who wrote it, and the same burden of the human author who wrote it. Those intentions are indistinguishable by a, a solid reading, a sound reading of the biblical text. Moreover, one can discover what is this burden of the divine and human authors by recognizing the author's intentional use of words, phrases, and ideas that came before and had previously shaped his and his audience's thinking and theology. So by the time we get to the chronicler's writing of 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Chronicles, there's lots of revelation that has come before that that biblical writer and his audience are already aware of. And so if we key in to the chronicler's use of those various words, phrases, ideas, and how those things that came before are informing him, then we can actually discover what is that author's intention in writing. In Second Chronicles, is a great place to observe and apply this Bible study principle of antecedent theology. We began to do this last week when we looked at First Chronicles, but tonight I want to just walk our way into Second Chronicles from the beginning in Genesis chapter 17. So turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17, and what Second Chronicles, first and second Chronicles, really, end up highlighting that biblical writer's burden for his audience, then current, began long ago in promises made to Abraham. This was the chronicler's antecedent theology. 
Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Now it happened that when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless so that I may confirm my covenant between me and you and that I may multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God spoke with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations, and no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will go forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. And I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God." God, by virtue of promising future blessings to Abraham, Abram then becoming Abraham, is creating an expectation for him and for his descendants. You can just hear it in the reading there, namely in verse 7, between, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you. I will be God to you and to your seed after you. I will give to you and your seed after you, etc. Abraham and his descendants are in view to be recipients of these promises. And so God is here creating an anticipation in Abraham and in his descendants for the things outlined in the covenant promises. Here's what they included. According to verses 2 through 5, this covenant included numerous nations from Abraham. God promised also plenty of children, according to verse 6. He would make him fruitful. In verse 6 also, kings would come from Abraham's offspring. And kings will go forth from you. So not just people, not just children, not just a variety or multiple nations, but also kings over those nations. Next, an everlasting, unbreakable, personal covenant, according to verse 7. Throughout their generations, he says it's an everlasting covenant, and he would be God to you and to your seed after you. So this is an everlasting, unbreakable, personal covenant. And verse 8, land, specifically, not just any land, but the very land that Abraham himself had traversed on all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And then last but not least, according to verse 8, I will be their God. They had God himself promised to them. All of these things, all of these promises were made to Abram, Abraham as a part of the Abrahamic covenant. And this anticipation for a king, it continues and narrows among the descendants of Abraham. So fast forward to Genesis chapter 49, where the recipients of the blessing or these promises, these descendants, not only descendants of Abraham, not only descendants of Isaac, but now specific descendants of Jacob, descendants of Israel. They have 12 sons, he does. In chapter 48, Joseph gets 
his place among the tribes get taken for two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And because Levi will end up not being counted among the tribes because he has no inheritance in the specific land, that would be the 13 total. But because Israel isn't counted in the land promises, that brings the total of those who inherit the land to 12, 12 tribes of Israel. Among those tribes, Judah is singled out as receiving the particular promise of kings. Notice in verse 8, Judah's blessing. Judah, as for you, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He, lies, he ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dark from wine and his teeth white from milk. In the middle of this blessing that's pronounced on Judah, the scepter, verse 10, shall not depart from him, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. A scepter, a ruler's staff. Here the kings who would come from Abraham, there is a scepter, this king who will rule and he will specifically be of the tribe of Judah. So here the the promises given to Abraham, at least one aspect of that promise is honed in on the tribe of Judah. The comparison to a lion is why later this ruler becomes known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. As we mentioned last week in 1 Chronicles, the Davidic covenant comes in chapter 17, and David is promised a king whose throne endures forever. So the kings that will come from Abraham, specifically through Judah's tribe have a specific family in view by the time we get to King David. And though David is king, it is a descendant of David who will have the promises and maintain rule forever. Just go to Psalm 89. There's perhaps no better place to see this than Psalm 89. Here, Ethan the Ezraite who had been appointed to write music and lead the nation in song, writes about the specific covenant of David and this Davidic king. Just jump down to verse 19. Ethan writes this, Formerly you spoke in vision to your holy ones and said, I have bestowed help to a mighty one. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand will be established. My arm also will will strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of uprightness afflict him. But I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him. And in my name, his horn will be exalted. I shall also set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He will call to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. 
so I will set his seed to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Here God articulates in poetic form the covenant of David. Continuing on in verse 30, if his son forsakes if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they profane my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with striking. But I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal, false, deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not profane, nor will I alter what comes forth from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness in the sky and the witness in the sky is faithful. Selah. This being written during David's day, we are long past that by the time we get to Second Chronicles. David's reign ended about 970 B.C., and Judah's exile occurred in 586 B.C., centuries later. The Persian king Cyrus makes a decree in the first year of his reign to rebuild the temple, that's 2 Chronicles 36, 23. He, that decree was made in 550 B.C. And Chronicles would have been written about 100 years later, sometime between 450 and 430. So by the time the chronicler writes what is now two books in your Bible, First and Second Chronicles, he is... Five, about five and a half centuries after the promises have come to David. That's over twice America's history. I think America has been a nation less than half of the amount of time that elapsed between the promises given to David and the time Second Chronicles is written. So that audience coming back into the land having that decree made by a pagan king, the Persian king Cyrus, is still wondering, will God still keep his word to King David? Is there a Davidic king still coming? Will we ever see another rebuilt temple? Will we again control the land? Will we ever see rest here without fear of our enemies? Is God's shalom still coming. In 2 Chronicles, the book of Chronicles, first and second, is God's resounding yes to these questions. Yes, God will keep his word to King David. Yes, there is a Davidic king coming. Yes, we will see a rebuilt temple firmly established. Israel will gain control of the land of Canaan. Yes, one day Israel will experience rest there without fear of her enemies. God's shalom is still coming. The faithful will see it. That's the point of Chronicles. You remember last week, the purpose of the book is that Yahweh, the sovereign God of heaven, who created the world and everything in it, will fulfill his ancient promises to Israel for his glory through David's seed. The faithful will see it. Everything that God promised from Abraham, through the patriarchs, and through David's seed would come to fruition one day. But only those who are faithful would see the eventual fruition of all of God's promises. That's the point. And if we just go back to 1 Chronicles, you can turn there, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles now. As we have it here in our Bible, 2 Chronicles 
opens with these words. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now Solomon, the son of David, strengthened himself over his kingdom, and Yahweh his God was with him and highly exalted him. The chronicler doesn't want us to forget Solomon is a son of David. We'll see that this purpose just unfolds continually through the book of 2 Chronicles as ruler after ruler of the seed of David takes the throne, the kingdom is established, and the chronicler seems eager to highlight the successful accomplishments of David's seed. He wants us to know about not just the seed of David generally, but specifically the faithfulness of David's seed. Even bad kings, foolish kings among the seed of David get their faithfulness highlighted. And that's no accident. The details you read in First and Second Kings are conveniently glossed over, rushed through, or left out completely because he's aiming at something different for that audience. That audience coming back into the land, rebuilding the temple, seeing what God's doing while they don't have control of the land, they're without a legitimate king at that time. David's seed isn't reigning on the throne in Canaan. This chronicler wants to remind his audience that they should be longing for a descendant of David to reign. They should be looking forward, not to just any king of Israel to, to arise, but specifically a king from the tribe of Judah who is a descendant of David. No one else will do. The nation thrived under David's descendants, mostly, and so you should be looking forward to a reestablished kingdom under David's seed. And so the chronicler barely touches some of the worst details of the reign of these kings, and instead he emphasizes the faithfulness of Judah's rulers. He wants us to know to embrace the reign of David's seed. Embrace the reign of David's seed. And just detail after detail, king after king, account after account, it seems to be shouting, embrace the reign of David's seed. We see this in Chronicles at the beginning because it's introduced to us with Solomon's reign and the first accomplishment, so to speak, of King Solomon is that he is asking for godly wisdom. He's asking for godly wisdom. What, what would, a, would a descendant of David do if given carte blanche request, ask me for anything, well, the seed of David would ask for wisdom to rule well. And that's what we have in Solomon. Chapters 1 through 9, a chunk of Second Chronicles, detail for a Solomon's reign, and prominently within Solomon's reign, we get chapters 2 through 7, all about the rebuilding or not rebuilding, but the building of the temple. So what's significant about Solomon's reign in Second Chronicles is what Solomon primarily had to do with rebuilding the temple. You get that six chapters of Solomon's nine-chapter reign are consumed with the details of the rebuilding of the temple. So those two aspects of God's enduring promise David's seed, a king, and the temple, the chronicler is showing go hand in hand. The king and the temple go hand in hand. He doesn't even forget, after discussing the details of the temple being built, he doesn't forget to discuss that prominent prayer in chapter 6. Uh, he goes on to God's glory filling the temple in chapter 7. 
He talks about Solomon's accomplishments in chapter 8 and then the visit, the famous visit of the Queen of Sheba in chapter 9. And before we move on from Solomon's reign, I just have to highlight this in chapter 9. Notice what happened as a result of Solomon's exercise of, of wisdom as he reigned over the nation. The queen of Sheba is left breathless, and look at what she says in chapter 9, verse 7. How blessed are your men, how blessed are the, these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be Yahweh, your God, who delighted in you to set you on his throne as king for Yahweh, your God, because your God loved Israel to cause them to stand forever. Therefore, he gave you as king over them to do justice and righteousness. This pagan queen coming into Israel seeing God's wisdom exercised effectively over the nation, and what happens as a result? She acknowledges God as God, that Israel must be a blessed people because he has made, Israel has Solomon as their king. Uh, Yahweh's rule is being mediated through King Solomon, and therefore she acknowledges in verse 8 him, Yahweh, as the blessed God. Mission accomplished. When David's seed, with God's wisdom, having established and built the temple, is reigning over the nation of Israel. After this, Solomon's foolish son, Rehoboam, becomes king. And you'll notice if you just jump to chapter 10, verse 19, that when Israel separated from the house of David, this was described as rebellion on Israel's part. Verse 19 of chapter 10, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. What does the chronicler want us to know? That when the nation was separated, even though this was sovereignly ordained and brought about by God, because he says that too, this was on Israel's part. As far as Israel is concerned, when they separated from David, that was rebellion. He wants it to be clear that to not be under the reign of David's seed is, in fact, Sin. This is unfaithfulness from all those rebels who resist the reign of David's seed. But even the foolish king who facilitates the separation of the nation by listening to his young friends rather than the wise counselors who walked with Solomon, even he gets highlighted well, as if he's been a good king. Look down to chapter 11, verse 23. This is said of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, and he acted with discernment and distributed some of his sons throughout all the lands of Judah and Benjamin to all the fortified cities. And he gave them sustenance in abundance. And he sought a multitude of wives for them. I'm not so sure that's part of his discernment, but it does say that he acted with discernment and did these things. That is not a statement made about him in 1 Kings 14. Just com compare that to 1 Kings 14. Verse 22, this is after saying that Rehoboam was Solomon's son and he became king of Judah in verse 21. Verse 22 says, And Judah did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all that their fathers had done with the sins 
which they sinned. They also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars, Asherim, on every high hill and beneath every green tree. There were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which Yahweh dispossessed before the sons of Israel. That's a description of, of the way that Rehoboam led the nation Judah. That is not said in 2 Chronicles 11. Even note in verse uh, 6 of chapter 12, how more commendation is given about Rehoboam, not mentioned in 1 Kings. 2 Chronicles 12, 6. So the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, Yahweh is righteous. When Yahweh saw that they humbled themselves, the word of Yahweh came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, so that I will not bring them to ruin, but I will grant them some measure of escape, and my wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak, the king of Egypt. So there are three times they humbled themselves, they humbled themselves, they humbled themselves. There's no record of Rehoboam humbling himself in kings. What does the chronicler want us to know? The kings of Judah humbled themselves. That's what they do when they're indicted by God's prophets. Even the next king of Judah, Abijah, is seen as defending God's name and David's throne. Look at chapter 13, verse 18. Thus the sons of Israel were subdued at that time, and the sons of Judah were strong because they leaned upon Yahweh, the God of their fathers. Uh, if you just back up a little bit. This is uh, an account of Abijah's reign. And he says in verse 8, or verse 5, Do you not know that Yahweh the God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? There he's clearly saying, that the rule rightly belongs even over Israel to David's seed. Yet Jeroboam, verse 6, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his master. There again, couched in the language of rebellion, any attempt to resist the rule of David's seed. Worthless men, verse 7, gathered about him, vile men who proved too strong for Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, he was young and timid and could not exert his strength before them. So now you intend to exert your strength before the kingdom of Yahweh by the hand of the sons of David, being a great multitude and having with you the golden calves, which Jeroboam made for gods for you. And then just note how he talks about what they've done to the priests. Verse 9, you have driven out the priests of Yahweh, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests for the people of other lands. Whoever comes to ordain himself with a bull from the herd and seven rams, even he may become a priest of what are no gods. But as for us, Yahweh is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the sons of Aaron are ministering to Yahweh as priests, and the Levites are in their work. And every morning and evening they burn to Yahweh burnt offerings and fragrant incense and the showbread to set on the clean table and the golden lampstand with its lamps is ready to light every evening. For we keep the responsibility given by Yahweh our God, but you, Israel, have forsaken him. So he wants clearly it to be known that faithfulness is happening under the reign of David's seed as opposed to 
what's happening in Israel. God even delivers through Abijah in this instance. Verse 14, so Judah turned around and behold, they were attacked both front and rear. So they cried to Yahweh and the priests blew the trumpets. Then the men of Judah raised a shout of war. And when the men of Judah raised the shout of war, then it, w- then it was that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. So the sons of Israel fled before Judah, and God gave them into their hand. And Abijah and his people struck them down with a great slaughter, and 500,000 chosen men of Israel fell slain. Thus the sons of Israel were subdued at that time, and the sons of Judah were strong because they leaned upon Yahweh, the God of their fathers. There are contrast being made between Judah and Israel the success that Judah experiences because God is with them and the failure that Israel experiences who rejects the reign of David's seed. Asa, the next one in line, also experiences success and he's noted for doing good, what is good and right before Yahweh. Just look at verse two in chapter 14. And Asa did what was good and right in the sight of Yahweh his God, for he removed the foreign altars and high places, shattered the sacred pillars, cut the Asherim in pieces, and said for Judah to seek Yahweh, the God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandments. So here he's known for doing what's right, removing idols, Just notice even in verse 7 of chapter 14, he said to Judah why they have the land and rest. He says in verse 7, let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought Yahweh our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and succeeded. You just think, why are these quotes being found and and strategically placed in the mouth of Judah's kings by the chronicler? It's because he wants his audience to know Judah's rulers seek Yahweh, and this is why they have access to the land. He says, the land is still ours because we have sought Yahweh. We have sought him and he has given us rest. Land and rest belong to those who seek Yahweh, even under the reign of David's seed. All of these things are connected. Land, rest, David's seed, all from God even though later Asa lapsed in his obedience. Chapter 16, verse 7. Now at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have leaned on the king of Aram and have not leaned on Yahweh your God, therefore the military force of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. And then he reminds him of the victory that he once achieved, were, there, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim a vast military for, force with an exceedingly vast number of chariots and horsemen? Yet because you leaned on Yahweh, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of Yahweh move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those, who heart, those whose heart is wholly devoted to him. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars." So to not get the picture to be too rosy, he reminds them also of the failures of David's descendants. And again, I think what would this do to the original readers? Well, we would be looking forward to a descendant of David, 
a king of David reigning on the throne. Things were good. We won victories. They sought Yahweh. They established the priesthood. They maintained temple worship. And yet they didn't do these things perfectly. They didn't seek Yahweh perfectly. They didn't lean on him perfectly. They lapsed in their obedience. We need a descendant of David, but a better one. Look at Jehoshaphat in chapter 17, verse 3. And Yahweh was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the ways of his father David, in the, in the ways of his father David's earlier days, and did not seek the Baal, but sought the God of his father, walked in his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. So what happened as a result? Verse 5, Yahweh established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought presents to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. Here, here again, you'll see, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 4, even when the kings of Judah do err, they err, and the writer can't help but mention that it's like, verse 4, Israel. So he did not act as Israel did. This happens a number of times. In the book, just go forward again to the next king, Jehoram, chapter 21, verse 6. When the kings of Judah don't live up to David, the pattern that was set in King David, it's said to be like the kings of Israel. Chapter 21, verse 6, and he walked, this is Jehoram, in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for Ahab's daughter was his wife, and he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. So even still, when the kings of Judah err, don't look to a king of Israel. <laughs> you don't have any hope in a king outside of the kings of Judah. Because when the kings of Judah err, it's like those other guys, the kings of Israel. But even when they rebel, you'll notice in the very next verse, even when they rebel, the chronicler wants us to know this doesn't change the promises. The promises still stand even when the kings of Judah fail like the kings of Israel, verse 7 in chapter 21. However, Yahweh was not willing to make the house of David a ruin because of the covenant which he had cut with David, and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. Look forward to a seed of David. The promises still stand. Even the sin of the kings of Judah can't change the promises. Chapter 22, a similar note is mentioned when another seed of David fails, Ahaziah. Chapter 22, verses 3 and 4. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. So there again, a failure in the king of Judah is like a failure in the house of Israel, Ahab being a descendant of King Omri. It was this man's mo mother who sought to destroy the royal line. Verse 10, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son had died, so she rose and destroyed all the royal seed of the house of Judah. 
This is a controlling parent, isn't she? But Jehoshabeth, the king's daughter, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death and put him and his nurse in the bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the, king, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah, so she did not put him to death. So he was hiding with them in the house of God six years while Athaliah was reigning over the land. Here again, the chronicler is highlighting what? The promises still stand. Even when all the Davidic line is put to death, God miraculously preserves his promises. So you can count even when for a time the promises seem to have failed, you can count that God has somehow preserved his promises. All of this is cultivating in the people receiving this letter, this book, First and Second Chronicles, in anticipation that the promises still stand. And this just is, is repeated on and on and on and on and on. You have with the next king, uh, Joash. He finally rises to power, becomes king at seven years old, no less. Amaziah becomes a king after him. Experiences his successes, but he is an idolater. And so a more faithful king follows in Uzziah, but Uzziah is not perfect. Uzziah prospers the nation, and yet he becomes proud. Chapter 26, verse 16, but when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to Yahweh his God. And he entered the temple of Yahweh to burn incense on the altar of incense. So he generally did what was right, chapter 26, verses 4 and 5 say, but he tried to play the role of priest and king that did not go well. He became a leper for this. An unfaithful son of his rose. And then after him, another son rises who's unfaithful. He compromises with foreign nations. Finally, a more faithful son rises, and you have much space in the, in the letter committed to Hezekiah's reign in chapters 29 through 32, which becomes a significant chunk because he is, seems to be a most faithful son of David. And so the chronicler spends quite a bit of time denoting Hezekiah's reforms, uh, his restoration of temple worship, his reinstitution of the Passover, his organization of the priesthood, and his success over foreign enemies. All of these things just are, are glimpses of the success that the nation experiences under the reign of David's descendants. And not ironically, if you just fast forward these things, a uh, reestablishment of a faithful priesthood, a rebuilding of the temple, and institution of temple worship, all of these things become in full aspects of the ultimate seed of David's reign. Josiah is the, the last faithful priest, inst institutes reforms of his own, but you eventually have the book coming to an end after this faithful King Josiah, and again, the Passover being celebrated, you have, in short order, descendants of Josiah rise and fall until finally they just don't even have a king. They have a governor over the land, and then the eventual removal of the people in exile. All of this producing an anticipation in keeping with what we've 
just called the, the purpose of the book, that God would fulfill his ancient promises to Israel for his glory through David's seed. That's just hopefully helpful to look back at things that God has promised, kings through Abraham, a scepter, king, ruler coming through Judah, and then David's family specifically, all of those promises still stand. They are outstanding currently. A king reigning, a temple rebuilt, Israel, that is Abraham and his descendants, his faithful descendants, one day inheriting the promises in the land. So if you just thought, what are you, Christian, now, thousands of years, past those promises, thousands of years, past chronicles, what are you looking forward to, Christian? Do you look forward to those same promises that God has been for millennia, training his faithful people to anticipate. And you can just note all of those promises. A king, the land of Canaan, even Abraham receiving those promises, temple. Are you looking forward to all of those promises, all of those various aspects? In your mind, how easy is it for you to just reinterpret or spiritualize these things in your Bible reading? When you envision a kingdom that's coming, is it the land of Canaan that you think about? Even the same land that Abraham traversed in his sojournings? Do you look for a literal king, a literal temple, and one day when all the people who receive those promises literally would literally receive the fulfillment of them, Abraham and all the rest, you should train your heart to look forward to those promises. Those are still outstanding. And let me just show you, we'll end with this. Go to, go to Hebrews, and you can see the author of Hebrews was eager to put the very same promises made so long ago back in front of his New Testament audience to say, look forward to them. The promises still stand. He does this in chapter 1. Look at verse 13 after he has at length established that Jesus is the one, he's the one currently seated at God's right hand. He says this interesting statement, verse 13, it's not angels who have these things said about them, but to which of the angels, Hebrews 1.13, has he ever said, sit at my right hand until... I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. Zero. No angel has that ever been said to. Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. So there's still a time coming when that's to be the case. Verse 14, are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits, sent to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Here he's referring to a salvation that's coming, not a salvation that's already come, you see, in justification. This is an ultimate salvation that's in view. And so he is still looking until enemies are put under Christ's feet when that salvation will finally be inherited. The New Testament audience, chapter 2, verse 1, because of these things, are required to pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Jump down to verse 5. 
for he, God, did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. Wait, we've been talking about a coming world? Yes, the salvation that's coming regards a time when Christ's enemies are finally put under his feet. There are still rebels in rebellion against the seed of David. All of his enemies have not been vanquished. They have not been made to be put under his feet so that they no longer rail against him. What has been testified, verse 6, this. Someone has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. That is man. For in subjecting all things to him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. But now? We do not yet see all things subjected to him. That time is still coming. And so what? What does he say to do to a New Testament audience since these promises are outstanding, enemies will one day be put under his feet, there is a world yet to come when the ultimate salvation will be realized All of these things are connected, and so he tells this New Testament audience, chapter 4, verse 1, to fear. That is, fear and don't disbelieve, but believe. Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have fallen short of it. For indeed, we have had good news proclaimed to us, just as they also, but the word that was heard did not profit those who were not united with faith among those who heard. Here's the point. Even for a New Testament audience, there are remaining promises. There is a rest, a Sabbath yet coming when salvation will be realized. That is when King Jesus will reign on his throne with all of his enemies subdued under his feet, and he will at that time give as the king a descendant of Abraham and a descendant of David peace to Israel. There will be a resurrection and an inheritance given to all of Abraham's faithful descendants. All believers will one day inherit the promises to come. Do you look forward to that day? Are you anticipating a kingdom? And are you letting that anticipation, the hope that you have in those promises, order everything about your life in the here and now? The way you go about being married to your spouse, the way that you live in sexual purity, the way that you spend money, and the way that you spend your time the way you children honor and obey your parents, all of those various aspects of life should be shaped by the reality that there is a kingdom coming and those who will inherit the kingdom live their days now in fear and faith. That is what we must do. That is what Second Chronicles is teaching its audience who received it to do. That is what Chronicles still teaches us to do, to look forward to those promises that are coming. Let's pray. God, thank you for these incredible words that we would have no access to uh, without your own, own kindness to preserve your word for us, to speak a good word uh, a good word spoken in season, how, how good it is. And so I pray that you would help us to receive these words as such and that you would work in our lives such that we 
hope in a certain future, that what is coming, things that we cannot see, cannot hold, cannot taste, cannot touch, that they would be more certain to us than the very things that we see with our eyes, that you would teach us to walk by faith and not by sight, and that we would put off temporal pleasures, as did Moses and those other saints who walk by faith, that you would teach us, train us to walk by faith so that we too might inherit a kingdom to come. We pray all of this in the name of King Jesus. Amen.